There you go. Okay, hello everyone. We are on the second chat of Meet the Filmmaker sessions today. Uh, and we are going to talk about a very important film called Stonewall with a T, which deals with the LGBTQ movement and its rights, but from a transgender point of view. The focus is now on the trans population. And this is very important but because when we are talking about different groups, different prejudices, different racial, ethnic, and all those things, we are also talking about cross sections of different prejudices that come out with gender, with um, sexual orientation, gender orientation, whether it's biological or it's a choice or whatever the person's preferences are. And of course, when we are talking about transgender people, we know very well what's happening right now in a lot of places and all the violence that is directed to um, transgender uh, uh, people. So we are uh, talking today with uh, the film in question today is Stonewall with a T. And we have director Sami Namir Olivares with us. We also have Tanya Walker, who's a trans activist, and she is featured in the documentary. And they're going to talk more at length about this when we get there. We have Natalie Gologorski, who is a socially relevant film festival team member. And she's also a sociologist in her own right. I'm going to read everybody's bio in a second. But right now, I just want to tell you who's who. And you will be in the able hands of Louis Project as your moderator. So without further ado, let's me, let me make your introductions. Louis Project is the film editor of Counterpunch magazine and a member of New York Film Critics Online. He blogs as the unrepentant Marxist, louisproject.org, and covers a wide range of issues beside film including Black Lives Matter and transgender rights. Natalie Gologorski is a sociology researcher and educator with a passion for children's and youth's voices in learning. She recently completed her master's in sociology at the New School and for social research. And prior to that, spent a year in East Oakland, California, working as an AmeriCorps math support teacher as an un, uh, in an underserved public middle school. Um, Natalie has made some short films in high school and spent her childhood watching Turner classic movies on Sunday morning. So she is a film aficionado and she has been working with the festival on the seventh edition. She was um, specifically prepared to do the Q&A for this film when we had the festival online on the seventh edition and unfortunately last minute uh, unexpected changes did not allow us to have that session properly so that's that's why natalie is joining us today and we have samuel uh, who is the director as i mentioned of um uh stonewall with a t sammy namir olivares uh, he migrated to New York City from Puerto Rico after obtaining a bachelor's degree in journalism and public relations and earned his master's in international affairs in human rights from the new school. Hey, you are also new school. In Same new here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, He's wow. The new wow. <laughs> MA in philosophy. Me. Yeah. New school. That's That's cool. that great. His early career in journalism merged his academic pursuits as he focused on the stories of undocumented immigrants, the LGBTQ plus community and people of color. So this is going to be a very interesting talk. Uh, as I, uh, I didn't introduce myself, I am Nora Armani, founding artistic director of social uh, SR, the Socially Relevant Film Festival, 
whose mission is to shine the spotlight on films that otherwise may not get seen either because of content or because of the fact that they are dealing with some social issues that people might consider not so commercial. So, you know, so we like to be that festival, that platform that offers that opportunity. And uh, the film screen on Friday and Saturday. Uh, on Friday, we have the uh, seven o'clock session of the films that uh, we had a chat with the directors with yesterday. And a Stonewall with the T screens at um, 7 p.m. I mean, no, am I right? Yes, 9 p.m. on Friday evening. This coming Friday, 9 p.m. There are going to be Q&As afterwards. So whoever is watching and would like to make comments, please feel free to put your comments in the comment section right now and we will answer them. But also come back after the screening of the films to ask your questions to the filmmaker. On Saturday, we also have a very interesting program. The Saturday program is mostly focused on the prison system and the correction system. And it's about capital punishment, education in the prisons, and inside and outside, and how we deal with that. Of course, all these issues, when we are talking about these issues, it's always the minority within the minority that is the one that suffers the most. And this film here is one that deals with that. So without further ado, let me take my leave and leave you in the able hands of Louis Project. I'm going to come back towards the end with some of the questions and comments that the audience may have asked and continue to have the discussion. Okay, there you go. How do I get myself out yet? Okay, before we get started, uh, Natalie, I I'm gonna be asking questions, but you sh I assume you're gonna be jumping in anytime you have something you, you wanna either ask or say, I assume, is that right? Yeah, uh, so we'll yeah, I think so. I mean, whichever, if you wanna hand that off to me sometimes, that's also okay. Sure, okay. sure. Um, Anyway, I'd like to just say a word or two about um, my interest in this film. I, I reviewed it uh, actually when the, uh, the festival first opened uh, for Counterpunch. And uh, I thought it was a very important film, really well done. And uh, it's, it's, it's close to my heart for a number of reasons. One is that um, uh, I guess over the last uh, several years, I've been uh, reviewing films uh, made about uh, narrative films about uh, transgender gender people, including uh, a fantastic woman, a Chilean film uh, about a transgender woman in a long-term relationship with a, with a man and how his family tries to disown her after he dies. A really, really good, really important film. And then more recently, uh, The Garden I Left Behind, which was made by uh, a Brazilian uh, director, uh, Flavio Alves. Uh, and it's about... Um, again, a, a, a transgender woman in uh, living in um, Queens, uh, trying to make the transition, putting up with obstacles, particularly from a psychiatrist he's, he's, uh, she's seeing, who has to, you know, sign some paper in order for to make the full transition. And uh, what, I, what I find interesting is this film, in tandem with the others, makes me wonder if, if there's an affinity that, that Latino filmmakers have with... Um, these issues. I'm just posing that as, as a, an open question. Um, but one, one thing that, that uh, one other thing I'd want to say is that when I was in probably third grade, second grade, I was, you know, nine years old. I lived in a little village in Wood, uh, called Woodridge in upstate New York uh, in the Borscht Belt. And I came home from school one day and we, lit, we had an apartment above a, a nightclub called the Kentucky Club. And in the summer, they used to have uh, a jewel box review uh, come up to, uh, you know, to perform. And this was uh, a drag queens, uh, kind of like in Jewel, the uh, film. What was the film? Um, they made two versions. One, I think one was French and then one was American, uh, American film about a, a, a drag queen performer. Robin Williams was in it. I can't remember the title. But uh, anyhow, I, I'm, I go up to my apartment. 
And my mom is there with her sewing machine, and she's working on a sequin gown for Miss Vicky, who's a performer in, in the Jewel Box Review. And the way it was in, in my little village, in, you know, this is probably uh, 1954, 55, was that um, it was a very enlightened village. A lot of the people that lived there were um, people who had been in the Communist Party or Socialist Party and, and you know, still maintained uh, open, an open-mindedness about all sorts of questions, race, gender, and so on even though it was in the middle of the, of the, of the uh, witch hunt. And, you know, my mom never said to me, you know, Lewis, that's really a man or anything like that. She introduced her as Miss Vicky. I said hello, and, and that was it. And from that time on, I always said to myself, you know, if, if my mom was accepting, that's, that's something that I should accept as well, because my mom was, you know, was like my father, uh, someone who offered guidance and helped me, you know, helped me, develop values that, I've, that are still with me. And um, anyhow, that's, I, just, I just wanted to tell you where I'm coming from on this and why, why a film like this is important to me. So uh, I guess I, let me start with a question I had for um, Sammy. Um, I, you know, I looked at your head. Um, you have a website. Eight, it says 8053. Are, are you a candidate now or has that happened? Did it happen in the past? I won my election, so I'm district leader in Brooklyn, Williamsburg, and Bush Street. That's great. That's great. And so what I see is you, you're a man of many talents. You, you, you do, you're an activist, you're a, a writer, and a filmmaker. So I guess my question is, what, what motivated you to make this film? Where, where was the inspiration? Sure. So <laughs> I don't know if the, the short story of the long, but um, um, I think thematically, um, you know, I think shows me, I was, um, going back to, you know, Latinos, like, you know, being kind of the forefront of, of transgender and LGBTQ issues. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico and, um, I was, uh, gender has been kind of like an impactful in my life. And, um, my mother, you know, I, I consider her gender non-conforming. She never conformed to the gender norms of women in Puerto Rico. So my sister and I had a very early introduction to uh, transgression of gender. My mother wore short, short hair. She didn't like makeup. She didn't cook. She didn't decorate the home. She was always being wore pants. Um, so. She was very, um, everyone would say she was like against what women would do in Puerto Rico. So for my sister and me, it was always the curiosity of like how she could transgress the gender, you know, and be still a woman and, and all that. And um, I, I'm, I, I was gay, openly gay. My sister is lesbian. So there has been lurking in, the, in our family. However, Puerto Rico has one of the worst places to be transgender. Uh, I mean, it's not... I started journalism 10 years ago and I, one of the first people that I met were transgender women. And I was so fascinated by the way of resiliency of how they were doing community from the margin. So everything, you know, uh, you know, from like being drag queens or like doing sex work or like being unemployed for me as a humanist and a lens of social justice, I knew that there was wrong completely from the way that society and government treated transgender people particularly. If being gay was bad and, and being, uh, you know, I was bullied, forget about it. Being transgender was completely uh, almost death sentence in Puerto Rico. And then uh, I did an article. I started like interviewing and very interested. And one of my first articles as a journalist student was an investigative article, uh, like researching the history of transgenders in Puerto Rico transgender people, and um, I went into the rabbit hole of how much homo uh, transphobia there is, uh, killings and killings that we don't even know, uh, the, 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 how many of them fled Puerto Rico because of transphobia and because they needed health care, and how one of them was living in Germany because she needed like transition-related health care. Anyway, that first article and interviews, then I stay very involved in LGBTQ activism. And when I came to New York City, I came fleeing homophobia from Puerto Rico. So I thought that 
I was gonna come to a heaven for LGBTQ rights. And um, I joined the master's degree at the new school and I wanted to chose as a topic why transgender, I, I learned somewhere that transgender people didn't have civil rights in New York. And I was so infuriated about that. And I was like, how is it possible that New York City does not have civil rights? I said, that should be Republicans. That should be the churches and religious groups. So I'm gonna do, my thesis about this. My question was, why? What did the conservative and religious group did that transgender uh, people does not have civil rights? And that was the the question. And then I started interviewing. Tanya was one of the first uh, women that I spoke with. And then quickly I realized that that was not the true. Uh, it was actually not even conservative groups. And like the documentary, like tells more about the, the very complex situation, but. I think was coming to New York and seeing that it's not as a perfect place for LGBTQ rights when transgender people didn't have rights for the past 15 years and they they were organizing, they were doing protests and marches and no one knew about this. This was before Caitlyn Jenner, this was not anything like of transgender in the media before Laverne Cox and I was seeing also all these things in the ground of what transgender activists like Tanya were doing and the LGBTQ community was not highlighting it, not the media. And uh, I was like, someone has to tell this. So I decided to do my thesis as a documentary. So the documentary, I'm not a filmmaker per se, it's not my craft, as you could see in the technicality of the video, but it was more to document it because it was so powerful to see. I wanted their voices to speak by themselves. That's that's great. Uh, uh, I, see, I see Tanya's mic is, is uh, there's a slash through it. Can you hear me? Yes, Tanya? I can hear you. Oh, oh, oh yes. great, great. Uh, so, I, you know, uh, the film, I, I can't really, it's, it's not like the film is lacking in any way, but as I was watching it, I was, I was wondering, as I, as I heard different, uh, different uh, transgender women speaking, I, um, I, w I was wondering to myself, what, what was their uh, ch childhood like? What was it like uh, growing up uh, when, you, when you suddenly realized that you, you felt your, your identity was female and not, not the one that you were uh, genetically born with, and I, I know it must uh, must be difficult for a gay man to to deal with these issues in in Puerto Rico. But as a, as a young woman, what 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 kind of what kind of issues did you deal with? And and as as, a, as an African American, is were there any uh, you know it was a less or more of a burden having to having to deal with these these kinds of uh, you know challenges. And I think we didn't have a chance to introduce Tanya and so uh, sure. to talk about it. Tanya was just, is one of the top five, top three more, more active transgender activists in New York State for the past 20 years. Tanya is a veteran, actual veteran of war. Tanya is a veteran activist. Um, and Tanya, we'll talk about her. her I want to talk about her later work. She co-founded a group called New York Transgender Advocacy Group, which is featured in the documentary, uh, alongside another group of transgender women of color to advocate for their rights. One of the first, you know, trans -led groups and like by black women and, and Latinx women. And uh, Tanya, as the film says, um, advocated for the passive agenda for civil rights in New York. But Tanya was, um, she will talk, but um, Tanya now is on the board of other organizations uh, like New York Equality, uh, New York, um, Equality New York, sorry, and has been extremely active uh, in, in New York politics. And so, yeah, I just wanted to introduce Tanya. Thanks. Hi, uh, yeah, so you mean you want to know what, what, what I was going through in childhood? Uh, it was, um, you know, very difficult, you know, because at first when you are a child, everybody thinks you're gay, you know, so you don't really know what you are either. You know, you, people are calling you names and, you know, even in, can you, and in first grade, people started calling me names in first grade. Uh, I remember I went to grant school in South Plainfield, New Jersey. 
And uh, they were calling me names, you know, and uh, I should say not grand school because grand school, I was in kindergarten. They really didn't notice in kindergarten. But when I got to first grade at Roosevelt Elementary School, I should say, they started calling me names there. I mean, people, I mean, my family at home was calling me names. So, you know, I, I knew I was different. I knew I didn't feel like the gender that I was assigned at birth. Um, you know, I already had four sisters, but I felt just, I felt probably more effeminate than them. But, uh, you know, and my father always told me that I would grow out of it and that I would, uh, I would change. So I joined the US Army. Uh, when I turned 17, I joined the U.S. Army and I served in the Army for a few years. And, uh, you know, I thought I would change. I thought I would come out this, I thought I would come out uh, a cis hetero person or straight person or whatever and just get married with a wife and children. You know, this is what, this is the damage that, you know, parents can do to children, not understanding gender identity and not understanding, uh, you know, that children can be different from what they were assigned at birth and, and the damage of assigning children genders at birth can do, you know. So I went into the military, you know, and uh, I uh, was called a lot of names in the military, uh, you know, and I saw a lot. I saw a lot of people in the closet. And I, you know, I said, wow, you know, and I used to get harassed. I used to get called names. And, you know, I, I said, oh, there's gotta be a better way, you know? And when I went in, if, if they found out that you were trans or gay or whatever, there was no don't ask, don't tell, you were immediately put out of the military. No questions asked. You just nobody to talk to. You would just get put out, and you would, you know, they would just send you home. You know, even you know after all that basic training and that rough training and all the rough things you have to do, it's uh, you know it was it was you know it was appalling to know that you could be put out. But I didn't try to hide who I was all the time. You know, I couldn't wait till we got off duty on the weekends and we could leave and go to the clubs and stuff you know, back in the 80s in Germany. And uh, I was really happy we could do that. However, uh, you know, I found out that, you know, that I was different probably around the age of maybe four, wow. five. I found out I was different. I liked to, you know, my aunt had the most fabulous clothes. I loved wearing her clothes. She had fur coats. She had um, she had falls. She had uh, bugle beaded gowns and different things like that. My mother didn't wear stuff like that. She didn't wear furs and stuff like that. So we, used to, you know, as a family, my cousins and my mother and everybody we used to go out. To breakfast. And I said, no, I'm not going to go out to breakfast. I'd rather stay home and uh, enjoy my aunt's clothing in the mirror. I said, go ahead. I'm not hungry. I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to do anything. I was so excited to put on these stole, mink stoles and different things she had and gowns and just, you know, fabulous stuff, you know, so, you know, but uh, coming out is rough. It's rough being a black trans woman and the, you know, the intersectionality of race, class and, you know, you know, the socioeconomic group I come from and everything, it's just like, it's really rough. Especially since my grandfather was a minister. He was a uh, a minister who came to this country from Sierra Leone, Freetown. And, um, you know, the religious norms that my mother followed, you know, you're going to hell for being gay. You're going to hell for wearing women's clothes. You know, your, you know, strict religious upbringing. You know, my mother believed in having children by one man and uh, staying married to the same guy, you know, all her life. You know, she believed in those, you know, those 
you know, those religious norms and stuff like that. So therefore we all had the same mother and father and we all, you know, and we grew up in a house. It was like six of us. And, uh, you know, I was the only one that turned out to be queer, you know, that I know of. I know I have a sister that she was kind of bisexual. My mother's kind of bisexual. Um, you know, I've seen them with uh, people of the same gender and uh, growing up, but people ignored it and mainly focused on me and my, and my uh, queerness. You know, so, you know, it's, it's a difficult life, you know, and uh, very challenging, you know, and especially in education and going to school, you know, you're hated by your teachers, the principal, they knew you were queer. And, you know, they would pick on you or call you out and say you did something you really didn't do, you know. And uh, so, you know, it was it was a rough it's a rough been a rough ride, but loving myself and, you know, escaping all of that and growing up, you know, and seeing the civil rights movement growing up and stuff told me that one day I'll be able to fight for my rights and the rights of others. You know, watching uh, my mother cry after finding out Martin Luther King was killed as a little itty bitty child on TV and looking on TV and all the sadness and all the gloom and, you know, knowing who my grandfather was, you know, knowing how he was good friends with, uh, you know, after I, after I, you know, grew up, I found out he was good friends with President Truman and David Rockefeller and people like that. And uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. and, uh, different folks like that, and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, wow. you know, people like that. And it's in books, it's all on the internet, and uh, coming to this country, you know, and uh, I didn't know that as a kid. You know, my mother never told me anything like that. She married a truck driver, you know, so that put me in another class. And uh, eventually I, you know, like in the 90s, you know, after transitioning, in the late 80s, I decided to uh, go to college and try to get an education at Staten Island College in uh, Staten Island. And while I was there, I no one wanted to be the head of the LGB organization there, the L or the lesbian gay organization there. There was no, nothing else it was just lesbian gay. And so I took it upon myself to do it. So you know, uh, Guy V. Mullinari in 1994 said that Judge Karen Burstein uh, was not fit to serve as attorney general of New York State because she was an out lesbian. And um, I organized a protest at the campus because he had one of his staff members coming onto the campus and uh, some media came, you know, some newspaper at Staten Island Advance came and I guess, I don't know who else was there. And I held up a sign that said, gays and lesbians live in your borough too, shame on you. After that, I was run off the college campus after I had been there for three years and told not to return. And uh, then I was, un I was unable to continue my education, uh, you know, on that campus, you know, after trying effortlessly, you know, to try to, you know, return, uh, they said, there's nothing we could do. The police said there's nothing we could do, but I said my life was threatened. You know, I would like to complete my education and get my degree in social work. And uh, I was unsuccessful. And so therefore, you know, I just, uh, I returned to sex work, uh, survival sex work. And I got another education doing sex work, survival sex work. So I have a I have a lot under my belt now. <laughs> yeah. right, let me let, let me. <laughs> what a what a great uh, what a great reply. That's uh, I can see why uh, you would be, you would be a, a leader in this movement. You're you're really uh, really very very impressive that 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 whole ability to just put everything together like that. I really appreciate it. Uh, let me just. Um, this um, 
you know, I'm in my 70s, okay? And uh, so I have to be very careful about um, COVID-19 and uh, social distancing. But on um, June 14th, there was a, uh, a rally in, in uh, Brooklyn, the, um, at uh, the Brooklyn Museum. And, you know, I, was, I, I watched the videos and uh, I just, you know, I was, I was really, I just I found it so inspiring. Here was a, say up to fifteen thousand, maybe more people uh, were celebrating, uh, or not celebrating, but defending black trans rights. And when you when you compare that to the, you know to the film where you know that it's, it was there was beginning in the, like after two thousand ten two thousand fifteen to be the uh, more of like a support for for trans justice. To see to see something like that, I, I, I my, so my question is, how how do you gauge that the importance of that rally? Does it does it symbolize that that people's minds are beginning to change? I guess that's to, for Samuel and Tanya. Yes, I believe they're beginning to change, but not fast enough because uh, at least twenty four. Tra black uh, or transgender women have been murdered on, and most of them black uh, in 2020 this year already. The, these are the ones that we have on record. We don't know how many other trans women were actually murdered, but I know the last count I saw was like 24. So, um, you know, um, a hashtag and uh, a hashtag and uh, and just showing up and supporting is is not enough. We need more. Okay. We need more funding. We need more, um, you know, we need more uh, education, housing, uh, uh, culturally competent mental health professionals. You know, we need to be self-actualized in society as an Abraham Maslow's hierarchy, hierarchy of needs, as I always say, you know, um, you know, uh, it's, we need it for coming from the black community as well, because, uh, you know, the black community, you know, many of them uh, work, you know, still have their colonized minds. Uh, you know, um, I know transgender people were in these societies before colonization and they weren't killing them. But now after colonization and slavery, uh, you know, now we have Black people killing transgender people, you know, that are black like them um, because of who and what they are or, you know, and, and, you know, it's a particular hatred that they have towards us. And it's also misogyny, you know, uh, it's trans misogyny um, that they have, you know, against femininity and against women or anybody feminine or anything feminine. And it's really, um, you know, it's really, you know, you know, destroying the fabric of society by not uh, letting, you know, black trans women be who they are. And, uh, you know, I believe that the religious organizations uh, or clergy or faith organizations need to also get educated and help us as well. I mean, because black lives don't matter until black trans lives matter. I don't see how they could separate the two. I mean, I wear the same skin color as as other blacks. However, uh, they like to say that, oh, your community is over there. Your LGB community is over there. Um, you're not a part of us. They separate us from the black community. I mean, people within the community. And I think that's very dangerous and damaging to not only the community, but to society at large, that they uh, would do something like that. You know, and it, it's, you know, and transgender women, you know, are deserving of human and civil rights. And we have an administration in Washington that, uh, you know, when he comes out with his, you know, genocidal policies and, and laws and rules, it mainly affects uh, trans women of color and poor, and black trans women, uh, mainly, it affects immigrants. 
it infects, you know, people who are marginalized in society, you know, uh, more than anyone else. And I think they're also, his genocidal policies are very dangerous. And uh, it's part of the reason why we've lost 24 uh, trans women or mostly black trans women this year. And, uh, you know, um, I think it's, uh, it's very sad. And um, that's what gives me the energy to keep fighting, you know, because um, you know, I'm a veteran. I served this country. Um, the, one, the, the guy in power is a five-time draft dodger who claimed he had bone spurs, you know. And, um, you know, I feel like, you know, that I and we deserve to be treated better in uh, society. Samuel, do you, do you want to do you want to uh, chime in or say anything on, on this? I mean, no, yeah. Ben, yes, yeah. Uh, Natalie, um, why don't why don't you uh, uh, say, have uh, your your play? You know, uh, jump in and and you must have some uh, questions or or comments. Yeah, I was actually just going to ask if I could jump in. Um, sure, go ahead. So if I if I can just share a little anecdote really quickly that gives context for my question. Um, I went to a, a small historically women's college for my undergrad. It's in Oakland, California. It's called Mills College. Um, really tiny. And they happen to have like an experimental preschool on campus for the education students. And they made the news because there was, I think, a two or three-year-old child I, I who went to that school who um, who ca came out as transgender um, in the in the preschool and and the child they respected the child's new pronouns and outfits and a new name even um, and and I guess there was you know a lot of strong opinions from the community about this. Uh, and I, but I was thinking about how, like, you know, that would have been hard to do 20 years ago. But also because I have an interest in in, in children, I was wondering actually what what either Sammy or Tanya think about um, transgender and queer children growing up today, and what it's like for them. You want me to go? Uh, it's rough under uh, the Trump administration. It's rough. Um, there's all these, uh, you know, I've been advocating for uh, for the passage of, passage of gender, uh, the Gender Non-Discrimination Act in New York State for the past 17 years, uh, for 17 years, because it just passed in 2019. Uh, it was signed into law by Governor Cuomo, the, uh, the gender bill, and um, we fought for that bill to protect children as well uh, in accommodations, housing, um, credit, whatever, you know, but, and, you, you know, and education. I think that um, that comprehensive sex ed needs to be taught in schools uh, without, comp and, you know, and, and, you know, they need to learn about, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity in elementary school. I mean, we've been here since the beginning of time. I mean, let's get with it. Um, because it's very dangerous bullying and suicide when you have uh, children attacking one another or, or demeaning each other and also uh, attacking each other violently, which could be verbal or physical violence in schools. I mean, the schools is a place where we should be getting an education. Um, and there should also be cultural sensitivity around that child's life and who that child is and about gender identity and, and, and sexuality and sexual orientation. And it should be taught. It should, you know, everyone in, the, in that system should have to be forced to learn about, uh, you know, you know, learn and become culturally competent or, or around cultural competency and uh, transgender people because 
um, you don't want that child to commit suicide and you don't want to be the teacher or faculty member with blood on your hands for not protecting that transgender child. So um, people should be aware of, of how they are approaching uh, the, uh, the, you know, this child and uh, be aware that, you know, of the harms that they could cause by not, by, by being willfully ignorant or not, you know, and not wanting to learn about trans people. I mean, what Tanya said, it, it is the, 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 the hear me well? Um, youth, particularly, you know, I'm living in the youth across the country. Um, you know, the, the, unfortunately, the, ba the bathroom battleground is still happening. I work at Lambda Legal, and there are, you know, schools still not allowing transgender students to go to the bathroom that matches their gender, uh, teachers that are misgendering the students and are not allowing them to, you, you know, respect the names that they prefer, their genders would they identify, the, the pronoun they identify with, um, miscalling them, not letting them use the, the uniform that they want. So there's still a lot of things, particularly in rural areas that trans youth are, are going through. However, I want to just to quickly add that a lot of things also are changing. Um, there's an organization in New York called uh, Family, Gender Family Project, and they, they deal with youth. And there are so many like accepting parents uh, now because they have been educated by precisely, you know, documentaries or like the, the media coverage after Laverne Cox and after um, a Caitlyn Jenner and other like movies that it's really opening the path. Um, so I think when you see these trans kids of accepting parents, they are so happy. They have so so much self esteem. They are so confident, and you could see the love pouring through their eyes. Um, and and I'm not, uh, having like more like mental health like better mental health, um, the difference is striking. However, of course, when they go to the world, they, they go and face a lot of uh, discrimination yet. But the, the difference between it is, it's dramatically. Uh, there are, uh, there's one documentary about transgender youth, I think in Alaska or somewhere, I saw it, the documentary a few months ago, and it was like beautiful, how happy and normal this group were. It was unbelievable. And you know what, too? Oh. We show, that documentary shows that, that transgender people are normal as us. And like people think, you know, the mental health and the suicide rate, it is not for being transgender. It is for the societal discrimination. It is for being pushed aside. It's, there's no problem of being transgender. It is society which have a problem. And these kids that are growing very normal just exemplify it. Yes, and you know, I look up to people, to dads like Dwayne Wade for, for coming out in support of their transgender uh, child, Zion, and all the ridicule and the, and the meanness of society uh, against him and his family about having a transgender child. You know, a father, a black father and all these intersectionalities and and systems of oppression you know and structural racism and all this stuff going on and i, I you know he has the nerve to come out in support of his transgender child zion that uh that gives me hope in the black community that this father uh, you know it takes a real human being and a real parent to come out and support your child and learn about what you didn't know before. Because uh, Dwayne Wade didn't know anything about transgender people or anything, but was willing to uh, go into the community and, and learn from uh, 
transgender people who are out and proud in society. And, uh, you know, I really respect Dwayne Wade's decision to be out about loving their transgender child, you know, and uh, today. And um, I, I'm really proud of Zion because Zion could save the lives, help save the lives of many other trans youth who are questioning or who are about to take their own life because they are who they are and they're born that way. Gender is in your mind, not in your genitals. Okay. Um, I, uh, I have other, I have other questions. I was, I was sort of expecting um, Nora to to, uh, to to come back into this. She said she's going to come back after forty five minutes. Uh, what do you think? Should, should I continue? I or did, but I, I think that, there she is. Such an Speak incredible of the devil. conversation that I don't want to come here and interrupt. I'm put a message to Tanya. You're a ball of fire, and oh, this okay. is how <laughs> we should stand up and fight this fight. Because people have to understand that transgender people are people first. First, the people is the key word here, not the trans, not the gender, not the this, not the that. People. And that is what people don't understand. And films like this and discussions like this are very important. And the school system is a key player in this because um, when we go into early childhood education and we instruct people that bullying is no good and people have the right to be different and whether that difference is in the hair color or uh, the skin color or the gender then then we can start building a society that does not is not constructed on exclusivism or exclusion but is built on inclusion and being inclusive of everyone and then, of course, the intersections are very important here. We are doing a retrospective on Black voices. And it's very important to remember that there are Black people and Black communities that are in every type of grouping or minority that we are talking about. And we are not grouping these people together because we want to marginalize them, but we want we are labeling or putting that name because we want to draw attention to a problem that exists. And this is very, very important. I have a question here from one of the comment uh, commentators, somebody watching. Actually, it's uh, Jewel Media, Ching Jewel, our, one of our filmmakers who uh, has two films in the selection. And she's asking directly to Tanya. She says, Tanya, how can we help? There you go. Here is the question. How can you help? By helping us. You can help us by, uh, by definitely giving to trans-led organizations or to LGBT organizations like Equality New York. Uh, um, and... Um, you can also help by helping us to uh, tell our stories, help us to write our stories, uh, and help us to, you know, help us to write books. Because I would like to write a book, but I need help. Um, you know about my life. You know I have a lot of things to say and a lot of things to tell. Uh, but the best way is to, and definitely to educate yourself on transgender issues. I mean become uh you know become an ally there's different ways to become an ally to the trans community um and 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 definitely just i mean you know do more than just a like or a hashtag on a website um when you see a trans person being abused uh please uh, uh please stand up for them and help to educate others as a cis person with cis privilege because we don't have those privileges and uh Definitely, uh, I mean, I need 
you know, more outlets to, to, you know, to be able to tell my story, but I definitely want to maybe start writing a couple of books. I don't know where, when, why, or how to start, but I would like to write a book, you know, on, you know, on my life experiences and uh, the experiences of people in the trans community. Well, actually, writing a book doesn't have uh, many secrets to it. Of course, it's great to be funded and distributed and produced, but I heard your life when you were talking about your childhood and yeah. what you went through and uh, the army. And it's like, it's funny because it's not funny, not in a ha ha way, but strange because you're trying to get integrated you're making every effort and at every step of the way you're getting a slap in the face and this is what is the gist of your book it's a slap in the face and a slap in the face is like putting it so mildly where i wish it ended at a slap we're talking about violence here or cutting people's throats and killings and and you know discrimination that is genocidal like you were saying so um maybe i don't know what how we can maybe you can start by writing a, a film a short story of a, a short film which is relatively easier to make or yeah. A narrative feature film that you know can start now with you, your character now, an activist, and then a conversation starts, and then you backtrace and with flashbacks and things. And uh, I mean, from the point of view of the film festival, I mean, I'd be more than happy to read and give you feedback if you have some ideas put together. And we also have a film script writing competition, uh, not at this series, of course, but annually when we do the festival and hopefully next March we'll have the festival's eighth edition. And it's like by seeing how other people have done it. And it's basically, you know, once you crack the code, then it's very easy, relatively easy. It's easier said than done. But your story is so fascinating that it definitely needs to be told. Oh, and thank you. down. Thank you. And if people like Sammy definitely help fund people like Sammy who are who are putting these films out there. Uh, we need more because uh, people like to people are more visual these days. They want to see. They they do Facebook Live all the time. They you know they we need more media, more exposure uh, yeah. through uh, film, uh, like you said, uh, and definitely and and like Sammy, Sammy really helped you know really helped put us out there, and, and you know we need to support people who are who are who are um, you know in the community who are also. Uh, helping us to get more exposure uh, where people can learn. Because yeah. uh, some people, that's the only way they learn. Absolutely. I think exposure is key because yeah. uh, ignorance about a, a topic or something can make opinionated about it without even knowing anything about it. But once they get to know the person, they know what the story is, they know you as a person, yeah. because your life is fascinating. You've been, you've done so much and it, it's right, wow. And then people know, wait a minute, is this, all these things happen to her? It's yeah. unbelievable. And then they start thinking in a different way. Yes. I think the manager, at Housing Works for seven years in a TGNC and B program. And I have a lot of stories of having to, to teach cultural sensitivity while trying to help a client with mental illness and substance abuse problems. You know, I, I have those stories as well. So I carry a lot under my belt, a lot of history under my belt of, of working in the field in a clinical setting with a 
with a program director and a case manager supervisor, and I was a case manager. I also worked as a community follow-up worker with single families and adults who uh, were homeless, uh, addicted to drugs, uh, and also HIV positive. Uh, I've done that kind of work as well without a degree, but I had those experiences. Yeah, it's like the, field work, the actual hands-on field work. Yes. I can even see something like this becoming a, a Netflix series, you know, because it's like so many intertwined stories from one to the next, from one to the next. And, that, you know. God listened to you. Yeah. <laughs> if I may Can jump in a second. Natalie is trying to say something. Yes, Natalie. Sorry, I don't have the loudest voice. I, I know. But um, <laughs> I, I'm more of a researcher than a presenter, but I try. Uh, so, you know, speaking of that, I was actually wondering what you thought of, since we're talking about trans representation in the media, there's this great show from FX. It's on Netflix called Pose that I've been kind of obsessed with. I mean, I just finished the second season and um, I don't know, it seems like it's, it, it, the people said it made history for having like the most trans actors and actresses in a show and also writing for the show. So I was wondering I, what you think of that. Yeah, okay. I will let um, Tanya talk about FX uh, post, but before I wanna say that this documentary, um, I didn't, pick the subjects. The subjects came in a snowball, what we use in, in social, in a, the academia, the snowball effect that you get one transgender person and the subject and then that person keeps recommending you. So I did not, it was not intentional to have people of color as the sub subjects of the documentary. They're not there because I wanted to say, okay, we need, a, we need transgender, black transgender women, we need Latinx transgender women. No, it was, the, I went to an event and I did it, it's an anthropological study. So I didn't show them. They were literally the most active at the moment. Why? Because of their life experiences. They are at, living at the most margin and the intersections of oppression. Black transgender women and Latinx had been the most active in the streets uh, advocating and fighting for. So it was literally, it's a, a real depiction of life on those years of who were on the streets. Of course, I have a commitment to, to diversity, racially and gender, but they were literally whoever, you know, was there actually leading those marches. So I wanted to say that they are overrepresented as well in activism, in the activism in New York, they're like 90% of the activists fighting for civil rights were transgender women of color. And that tells you how much because of the life conditions. So I just wanted to say that about the documentary. Yeah, it's an interesting yeah, point that you are making because that is the, the best way to go about it. You didn't go and uh, create a, a false uh, representative statistics of say, okay, I'm going to use one like this and one like that from this group and that group. But it reflects a reality out there, which is the strength of any documentary. When you're making a documentary, you want to reflect the real situation out there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, what I, you know, uh, and thank you, Sammy, because you did a great job on that documentary. Um, you know, uh, like Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson were instrumental in were instrumental in starting the actually kicking off the gay rights movement and and actually uh, uh, helping uh, helping us with some of the rights that the LGBT community has today. Um, uh, with at Stonewall, uh, getting beat by the police and uh, being arrested for wearing uh, more than three female garments because that's all you were allowed to wear uh, during Stonewall. And uh, Sylvia Vera and Marsha stood up to uh, intolerance and hatred because they didn't have anything to lose. They didn't have, they weren't gonna lose a will, you know, from their families. They were already kicked out and tossed into the streets 
already, uh, you know, with other uh, young people at that time. And they, you know, they were the ones getting beat up outside of the Stonewall uh, and getting arrested the most because many of the gay people that were inside Stonewall were, they were educated, you know, mostly white people who had, who were in the closet, who really had, had the, the means to pay off the police so that they wouldn't be outed or get their name in a newspaper because back then uh, gay people were targeted uh, and outed in the newspaper for being uh, busted in a bar. So, uh, you know, Marjorie Johnson and Sylvia didn't have those means. And so uh, therefore they were the most vulnerable and uh, they were there fighting, uh, you know, because they got tired of seeing gay people having to be in the closet, threatened, having, you know, money taken from them by the police, you know, and they fought and they put their lives on the line for the rights that that most in the LGBT community take for granted. It was trans women of color and black trans women who fought for the gay rights that people uh, are experiencing today. And it was a riot, Stonewall was a riot. And most of the photos that you see of the folks who are in those, you know, for the Stonewall riot, those were like two or three days later after the initial, uh, the initial, initial start of the riot because the cops kept busting Stonewall and Marsha, I met Marsha in 1986, but we didn't talk about Stonewall. Marsha was just, you know, Marsha would just stand on the corner collecting money to give to the homeless youth that were out there. You know, and she would be talking to other people and uh, she was pretty brilliant. You know, Marsha was brilliant. And she used to read the New York Times in the park, you know, and she really wanted the LGBT community to be safe and definitely be humanized in society, having civil and human rights, being, you know, entrepreneurs, homeowners, being able to, you know, to, to uh, live in society uh, beside everyone else. You know, and, and, and these are the strong trans women who I stand on the shoulders of to this day. Yeah. And you are carrying the legacy in a very brilliant way. So you, uh, power to you and courage. And, you know, anytime if you need any, I don't know, exposure or something, and we'll be more than happy to help in this because this is a very, very important topic. It's a topic that often gets forgotten about and it's a violence that gets swept under the carpet and nobody wants to deal with it. And it's very, very, very important. And um, we can still continue if you have another question, but let me just uh, mention one thing, that the entire program we are offering is offered free of charge. We are making these films available for which I specifically want to thank the filmmakers for allowing us the uh, possibility of uh, streaming the films free of charge because just for what you were saying, we want to make the public, the general public aware and educated, enlightened about these issues. And for that, no money is being charged. People can just log in. I mean, they have to register so they get the link and password to the film and then they can view it. However, we are encouraging people to make donations uh, in exchange if they want, if they can. And we are sharing those donations with the Equal Justice uh, Initiative with the uh, New York um, Civil Liberties Union and Real Works, which is a youth organization which allows teenagers uh, to express themselves to film through video, telling the, their own, uh, mostly their teenagers of color in this particular case, and to be able to find a platform to voice their uh, stories and express themselves. And um, for Tanya, I mean, if you watch that uh, the series, 
you can just you know there they usually tell you with script writing there are only 36 stories and everything else is a combination thereof and it there's a structure and there's structure one structure two structure three and you just fill in the blanks with your own stories and i would i would be the first and to go watch that movie <laughs> and you should star in it you should be playing your own life oh thank you thank you because you know right now the trump administration is trying to uh take 1557 away from transgender health care so i'm currently uh a party to a lawsuit against the trump administration uh uh, and we're suing the Trump administration uh, so that we, so that transgender people won't be discriminated against, and they can have access to the Affordable Care Act. And uh, you know that's what I'm involved with right now. And it's just, it's, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but it's very, very important. Yeah. Yes. So I'm. Uh, done with what i had to announce uh, so if you have questions uh louis to wrap like maybe a wrapping question or natalie if you have another question you want to jump in feel free i wanted um i wanted to add to the question of how can people help also you know in addition to donate i think not making assumptions as broad as that. I think not making assumptions can make people, you know, ask questions so get educated, right? Under that umbrella. Also, um, I was saying that for something, but I forgot about it. But I, I do think that as sharing stories of transgender women, they there are so many people like Tanya with incredible stories. And I think the visibility of whether they are successful in, in not only the negative, right? Like that's what this documentary is not focused on the death, um, like the death of Mark Chappie Johnson. I wanted to focus on their resiliency, on their activism. Yes, they are fighting for, you know, anti-violence, but it's mostly about the positive aspect of how they build community. So wherever you see a story like Post, right? It's one of the stories, the, not only the, the story of Post, but like the, the actresses, MJ Rodriguez and like, you know, actresses getting awards. And I think that as more as people see transgender people as humans, as as uh, 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 as productive members of society, as, as thriving in a positive life, that will help so much because one of the things that, that's why many of the trans violence is not in the documentary, is because transgender women themselves ask me not to regurgitate yeah. on the uh, on talking about transgender women only when they are killed and dead, right? We want to talk about them when they are alive, and that's why I I I am so joyful that Tanya is always you know in these panels because she's talking about her life experiences and fighting and and losses, and I think that that's what we need to like sharing the stories. I think the person who asked the the question was a filmmaker doing short, including transgender subjects, um, have, highlighting them, questioning yeah. people as well. So in, when I'm in a panel, I'm like, do you have a, people of color? Do you have transgender people? And like, I think bringing up that disability uh, is super important. Yeah, that's a very important point because like you say, it's always the sensationalism of the murders and the violence that is highlighted instead of, um, and that that means it becomes a uh, statistics, it becomes a um, horror, uh, like important uh, news selling story, instead of delving deeper and looking at the lives of these people and treating them as fully fledged members of society with their rights and, you know, talking about them uh, about their dreams, about their aspirations, about their the problems they're running into. So as like you say, as alive people that are alive, just like Tanya is full of life and <laughs> as opposed to somebody who has been murdered in a back alley. Yeah. So yeah. Tanya, 
polls, as far as polls is concerned, is supposed to mirror what actually happened, I believe, back in the 90s or 80s or whatever. But I could add a lot to those stories. I mean, they glamorized a lot of uh, the lives of the trans community, but they tell some of some of the story. A lot of the stories are true. However, you know, I remember girls were winning trophies, trans women winning trophies in the ballroom and being homeless and being on the train with seven or eight trophies, seven or eight trophies on the train, homeless, sleeping on the train. So those stories and the stories that I know were not told are not told in pose, but I know the stories and they should come to me and ask me what That's it was like Nobody has. That's a great what you just described is a great scene in the movie that you're about to write. Yes. <laughs> well, that's why I asked the question. I wanted to know how true this was because they were oh, all the claims. That, that's what I said, people not assuming because a lot of well-intentioned people want to help. That's why. And then they come with this event or stuff like that or like a campaign, but never ask transgender people, how can I help you? What do you need? And sometimes, and I learned this very at the beginning, because they were like, well, I need a, 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 a subway car so I can go to this event. Or I, today I just need to stay home and watch TV, you know? And like, it's not always this kind of like, you know, philanthropic thing that we have to do. Sometimes it's like, I need to go, I, I need a friend to go to a movie. Like I need, you know, Right, like we we need to we're doing a birthday for a transgender girl next week. We need the cake, you know, and like it's not always at uh, this kind of like philanthropic, you know, donation or or panel or like I don't know a, a fundraising campaign. Sometimes it's just uh, it needs, and like we need to always go to the community and say, "What do you need? Like, how can I help?" And they will tell you a, a book. What how, you will never think like someone will tell you like oh, I need to write a book, right? Like, and helping Tanya write a book can have potential impact for decades when people read this book, right? So it's just not assuming of what the people need and like ask them. And I think we will be so oh, like you know it will be so much helpful. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So I'm just like I'm. I'm. You know. I'm. Um, Currently, you know, and and also about Pose, they, you know, I, I could, I could, I have, I could tell them, you know, I could cre help them create a lot of scenes. I've seen a lot, you know. I'm not, I can't, I don't have time to tell everything here, but I, I can help them create a lot of scenes of actual scenes and actual things, you know, that I've seen from those days, and um, to try not to glamorize it too much. Yeah, um, because it wasn't glamorous. I mean, even I would see it during the filming of Paris is Burning. Um, they didn't show, and I mean, I think Gina Livingston came to the salt mines because I was at with my girlfriend at the salt mines. We were homeless, and uh, they oh, and she asked me a question or something. I told her no, and they have they had LGBT youth of color, and some were white sleeping in the salt mines in the village. They, that's not in pose. Children were living in the salt mines, you know, in New York City. That, that's not in there. Yeah. I mean, the children, people threw out their children, nine-year-old children doing sex work, having to be forced into sex work. This is the reality and the harshness that's not shown, that's not seen. Yeah. It's very important not to glamorize because obviously the film we are talking about should not be something that's made in Hollywood. It's more like a down-to-earth European yeah. sort of uh, almost like a documentary style thing because it has to have the credibility. It has yeah. to have the real life, uh, you know, feet yeah. on the ground feel to it and not like... Uh, La La Land sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, we are having a fantastic conversation and I'm really feeling bad to be the bad guy and say we have to end it. 
<laughs> so, so we're already 14 minutes over. And I, I'll have uh, Louis say his last wrapping words and then I'll thank everyone. Or maybe I should thank everyone now and then have Louis say uh, his last uh, wrapping words. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am so glad we had this second chance because we missed having you last time. And I'm so glad we were able to do this, this uh, little retrospective and show your film again, Sammy, and have you with us, Tanya. And Natalie, thank you. And thank you so much, Louis, our staunch supporter of the festival <laughs> from the beginning. You know, I think you reviewed the film in uh, okay. your column, right? Okay. Can I quickly say something? Sorry, very late. Um, but before we leave, like I want to reiterate that where Tanya is living history and transgender rights exist today because of Tanya. Tanya, a New York transgender advocacy group, fought 17 years, no funding for the organization. They went for 17 years to Albany in buses and they talk in the, the doors, they knock on the doors of all the elected officials in Albany and convince them after 17 years to pass the Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act. So on Friday, you will see that in the documentary and it was because of her their work and they were so insistent, so touchful, so convincing. And uh, they stood in the, in the stairs last week with the governor and signed that law. And, and it was a beautiful thing to see how their activism actually had some impact for, for millions, you know? Uh, yeah. at the state of New York. So yeah. the first time that transgender people have rights, human rights in the law in New York, this you would think that that would have happened. That happened just last year. And Tanya was there and Tanya made it one of the, the key people who made it. So it, it is like living history. So we need to make it in the, in the history books. This is great. And so now this talk is going to be online. It's going to be on our YouTube channel. So you can ask other people to view it later on if they didn't join in now. And all this information is already in there. So now we know. And applaud your efforts. We applaud your efforts, Tania. Thank you so much. And Thank Louis, you. so you want to say something and wrap it? Oh, me? Oh, no, Louis. Oh, Louis. Oh, sorry. Me? Sorry. Oh, you too. It's oh. okay. Zoom. Uh, I think he's probably having an issue with his sound or something. I'm seeing Louis's image frozen. Uh, Natalie. Well. Uh, oh, here he is. He's back. Can you can you guys hear me? Yes, now we can. Oops, he jumped out. Uh, when the connection is not very strong, it kicks you out for some reason. I don't know if he'd be able to come back and say a final wrapping word, but in case he cannot, uh, let me thank you again, Tanya and Sammy, and keep thank up you. the good work. It's very, very important. The advocacy work, whether it's on the political level or on the social and entertainment level, entertainment is very important because sometimes with advocacy and with, um, you know, we stand up and make political speeches and switch off and then uh, you're back and they switch off. But with art and entertainment, we get to their hearts and they start thinking and feeling yeah yes just, Lou. I, I just i want to say that it's, I, i'm going to be, I'm going to be blogging about this uh this discussion the one yesterday uh on my blog which has a, a pretty uh a pr pretty wide reach and then i uh, got to get it out the word out on facebook uh over uh, 3500 friends who would be keenly interested in this in this uh discussion i think the the, the left really has to have a, a much much uh Better understanding of these issues, and I'm I'm doing the best I can to, you know, to make that uh, to make that happen. So I want to thank uh, Tanya and Samuel for for really a great presentations. I really appreciate you guys. Yeah, thank you. Also, as I said, it's going to be posted on our YouTube channel. You can share it, distribute it, and 
you know, feel free. And of course, come and be there for the Q and A after the film on uh, Friday. Thank you. Send me the invite. Bye bye. Yeah. <laughs> bye, bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.